my name is Jackie with Hub City Bookshop. And we are here, of course, with um, Nana Nequeti and Karen Russell. So um, Nana's book that we're talking about today is this lovely book, Walking on Cowrie Shelves. We are so excited. It's her pub day and we um, are blessed to be able to have her for our launch event. So we welcome her today. So Nana is a Cameroonian American writer, Kane Prize finalist and graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop. Her award-winning work has garnered fellowships from McDowell, Vermont Studio Center, UCross, Birdcliff, Kimblio, and she was a Hub City Writers in Re Writer in Residence in 2016. The, she was also at the Stadler Center for Poetry, the Wurlitzer Foundation, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and Clarion West Writers Workshop. As a professor of English, she teaches creative writing courses that explore her eclectic literary interests, ranging from graphic novels to medical humanities, on to exploring works by female authors in genres such as horror, Afrofuturism, and mystery. Nana's writing has been published in journals and magazines such as Brittle Paper, New Orleans Review, and The Baffler, among others. Her short story collection, Walking on Cowrie Shells, is of course out today. So um, we're also gonna introduce her in-conversation partner today, the wonderful Karen Russell, is the author of five books, including Orange World and Other Stories, and the novella Sleep Donation. Her first novel, Swamplandia, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, winner of the New York Public Library Young Lions Award, and one of the New York Times 10 Best Books of 2011. She has received MacArthur and Guggenheim Fellowships and is a former fellow of the NYPL Coleman Center and the American Academy in Berlin. Born and raised in Miami, Florida, she now lives in Portland, Oregon with her husband, son, and daughter. Thank you both so much for joining us. And I think I'm gonna turn it over to Karen first. Is that right? Yeah, just for a couple minutes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you so much for hosting us, Hope City. Um, and congratulations to my very dear friend, Nana, on this incredible achievement. I have to tell you guys, I have been um, counting down. <laughs> oh, Lord, uh, Karen, I told you, don't make me cry. I'll try. I'm going to try not to. <laughs> is that so awkward for you people? Usually, you know, I, this is a wonderful format because I get to actually make eye contact. Um, <laughs> With others, not not just not just my own crazy eyeball <laughs> in the self view. It's like, um, but yeah, I also feel really emotional because I had the extraordinary privilege of reading some of the stories and walking on cowrie shells when um, Nana was working on her thesis in Iowa. And I sort of I went there what must have been like this historically cold winter. I just remember it was like negative thirty degree temperatures and like all of the dogs were either inside or dead. It was like a <laughs> <laughs> I am from Miami, you know, it was, I, I had like a, I thought I could come there without a car and then just bought my groceries at that Casey's gas station. I give this to you for context because I read, I, yeah, I hadn't met Nana yet and I received her thesis manuscript and I just, and I mean this as a compliment, I was, I was so intimidated. I was like, I have no place. I, there's no, I have nothing to teach this person. I can witness, um, sort of the, the, the chrysalis bursting open and this like butterfly rocketing out into the ultraviolet. But I really felt, um, I really remember in the way that, you know, if something is really, uh, the way you're riveted to your skin at certain moments, um, when you recognize that something new is coming into the world. And I read these stories and thought, this is what fiction can be and do. Um, and I was just so impressed at, uh, you know, there's such a multiplicity of perspectives, which we appropriate, revise and reinvent. And it's just felt like this oasis, this sort of imaginative oasis. Um, and the language, which I know I'm preaching to the choir here. I bet a lot of you guys are really familiar with some of these stories already, but the language is exquisite, mind bending, claws to claws. Um, it just sort of shatters and remakes your per perception of, you know, other people in this world. Um, and I think like that was exactly in like the ice of Iowa. <laughs> that was the ax I needed to, just, like, um, to shatter sort of, uh, sort of some of these like received narratives, my own ideas about what a story could be or do. So um, I don't wanna go on and on forever. I thought maybe I could turn it over um, and Nana could just read a little bit so we could you know, you'll feel it yourselves, um, what I'm describing. Thank you so much, Karen. I have like a galaxy of thanks to give to people really quickly because this has been a very long journey. And um, 
like since I was like a little blue stocking, you know, slip of a girl who was quiet and just a nerdy little kid who was only just reading all the times. And my and my best friend was Elizabeth Bennett, and I used to call her Nizzy, and she knew all my secrets. So for me to get to this space where my book is actually out in the world, it's like a lifelong dream. And so many people have been wonderful in supporting me on this journey. Um, thank you, Jacques, for your words. Karen, you know who you are. As you all can see, my biggest cheerleader and just came to me in Iowa at the perfect time when I needed a kind of somebody who could see the possibility of what I was trying to do on the page and make me even better, you know, push me to explore characterizations, push me to explore interiority. And it was just, it was such a wonderful time, magical actually. I remember it was Karen Russell and Kevin Brockmeyer came for a sci-fi speculative fiction workshop, the first of its kind in Iowa. And I was like, yes, Mona from heaven, thank you. <laughs> thank you gods of literature. So that was my experience. And, um, and I'm so, just so thankful for people who've been there for me along the way. Of course, my lovely mother, Christina Nkwedi, my dad, Dr. David Nkwedi, my siblings, Angala, Nimbisi, Angie, to all my friends far and wide, I see Bose on the screen, like my besties, Bose, Cheryl, Shay. I was so incredibly happy. Um, my, my wonderful and now I mean and, and the Inquiry family. My name's actually like, you know, uh, Nome de Plume, which takes my last name and my mother's um, matrilineal side and patrilineal side. So Nana Inquiry, Nana family and Inquiry family have been so supportive of me. Um, to Rachel Kim at the and the three arts media team, particularly my um, Gray Wolf team, like they were so wonderful. We howl at the moon together. Um, my editor Steve Woodward, Katie DeBlinsky, Casey O'Neill, thank you so much for all that you do to make this this work a joy to get into the world. Um, I thank my Hub City family. You had me here, and you literally allowed me into your homes and into your shops, you gave me a space to live in, to create in, in 2016. And here I am coming full circle in uh, 2021. And I'm incredibly grateful to all of you joining me here tonight because this is my book baby. And I was gonna do like some corny Instagram photo where it was like, I, I was gonna swaddle the baby and, and do a bottle, but I spared you that. So, <laughs> you know, thank you for coming here when my book baby is finding its way in the world. So I'm gonna read um, a piece that I read, like. A, a very short excerpt from the piece that I read uh, December 8th, 2016 in Spartanburg, South Carolina at Hub City. And I thought like, you know, synchronicity, I'm coming full circle and, and offering up that work again, but now in its book form. All right. There are hymns, there are hymns, there are hymns, there are hosannas, there are hallelujahs. There are some who are struck dumb in his presence and those who are newborn linguists speaking in tongues. Eyes roll heavenward, limbs grow palsy, tears of joy, of penitence, of defiance are shed. Through this sound and this fury, Sister Gloria and Gassa, Minister of Music for the New Africa International Church of the Holy Redeemer, Brooklyn Battalion, is praying fervently. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Alpha and Omega. Thank you, O merciful one. Glory glorifies and magnifies the Almighty for the miracle he has wrought in the life of her daughter, Temperance. Her voice, once whispery, rises, then rises again as she sways to the unsung chorus, moving the faithful 20-person flock present for service that Sunday morning. And faithful they are to this fledgling church, its sanctuary, a dusty Brooklyn apartment, a donated space still undergoing a slow renovation that has spanned from Easter Sunday the year prior into an unknown future unto the day, end of days, perhaps. The congregation is sanguine in their shared burdens. Tried and tested, they will not be found lacking. So one had to watch one step on the unfinished floorboards, a mere reminder that Jesus himself was a carpenter, a man who knew the grain of cedar, of poplar, of acacia, and even the bitterest wormwood. So the single pane windows were unsealed and unshielding. Their translucent tarps fluttered in the draft like a host of angels' wings. Yes, the congregation of the New Africa International Church of the Holy Redeemer, they know they are blessed. Their leader, man of God, Pastor Godlath Okondan, journeyed all the way from church headquarters in Cameroon to share his special anointing. 
that very moment, the good pastor is laying hands on the forehead of Brother William, timbering all six feet of the man into the waiting arms of Sister Anna Shanti. By the spirit of Christ, by the body of Christ, by the blood of Christ, raining down rapid fire, holy fire, to break the ancestral curses that have kept the good brother from receiving his promotion, his increase. And now music, now songs of praise and thanksgiving. Glory steps forward. She pushes up her 1.5 drugstore reading glasses. Maybe it's time for plus two. And peers down at her hand assembled hymnal. The photocopied fruits of her labors to harvest gospel songs from back home, from across the continent. Nigeria's Agathemosis, Cameroon's Tribute Sisters, the Soweto Gospel Choir. Jesus, we love you, Lord. You don't make my life better. I go to thank you forevermore. Thank you, Baba, sings the congregation. Held and swayed by the baton of glory's pointer finger, keeping time, tapping notes in the air. She is gratified. There is no instrumental, uh, instrumental accompanying this chorus of warbling voices. Sister Ina is always flat. Yet she knows to her marrow that their voices are pleasing to he who matters utmost. You see, Glory knows the power of church music. In over 30 years of searching for a church home, she had been to many houses of worship and had come to know the quality of, of a church, not by the size of the hats on the church ladies' heads or the crisp white gloves of its ushers. She knows church by its music, by the way its people raise their voices in gratitude. Praise Jesus. She knows the Pentecostals love a good tambourine, a jangly rejoicing. She knows Catholics crave a holy hush, hums of contemplation. While the Southern Baptists were one for a gambling and a holy rolling, lovers of big, big voice belters, soul claps and organ riffs that settle on the sermons of their high stepping reverence like a hype man's cape across a shoulder blade. For glory, for his glory, the music had to be especially right that night because she is bursting with a mighty testimony. Her daughter, Constance, whose belly had lain fallow for over a decade, was now over three months pregnant. Praise Jesus. Five months ago in this very church, the man of God had laid hands on her visiting daughter. He had cast the spirit out the spirit of barrenness, hallelujah. And after he would pull glory aside and speak to her of serpents, a writhing Gordian knots in her daughter's insides of the agent of the enemy who had tried to steal her dear child's womb, of the spiritual war chicler that she had waged to protect it. Later, she would try to tell her daughter about those snakes, those twisty fists pummeling her from within. Oh, mom, Tempest said, sighing. I saw a specialist. Those were just five points. Oh, thank you. Oh, I love that story so much. And it was really, maybe we can start right there because I think I read maybe one of the original versions of that story. And I was so struck, you know, this is the work of um, many years now. And I think sometimes when people hear, oh, a short story collection, you know, if you're, um, if you're not familiar with kind of the, <laughs> the strange kind of valley of the shadow that a story has to travel to, to, to reach its final form, you might think, I really encounter this a lot myself, where somehow it's like such a symptom of like our Costco maximalist America, you know, <laughs> or like a novel, a doorstopper there. That's an achievement. A, a story is, it feels like such a, such a slight thing. And in fact, in my uh, experience, you know, stories have a very strange gestation, uh, not totally linear, not very predictable, <laughs> you know. So may, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about this particular story. You know, when I was rereading it, a lot of the the contours of it are still as they were, right? But I was just mm. noticing some really deft little changes um, in where, you know, it, where the stress is placed, particularly in this dialogue. Um, it's told in these alternating sections, right? So maybe, you know, that decision to tell it not just from the mother's point of view, not just from the daughter's point of view, but to do these kinds of switchbacks. Um, yeah, I knew very early on that I wanted those two kind of that dialectic, the mother and the daughter kind of singing in chorus. So we had that huge like lyrical and sermonic, you know, voice of God in the beginning. And that voice of God could take us anywhere. And I thought like these are two women are kind of 
using religion and their different takes and these perspectives on religion to kind of grapple with like the idea, like what is motherhood, like and, and the daughter in particular was dealing, you know, with the idea of you no, know, now I'm finally becoming a mother, but maybe there's something wrong with my child. How can I speak to my mother about this? Um, who I think is this person who is incredibly, you know, maybe um, more traditionalist, more um, in her own religious perspectives. Can she be a support for me? Can I turn to this God, you know? Um, and that was one of the things that I wanted to explore and have those two things pushing against each other. And I knew that that was gonna be, you know, um, like the kind of chrysalis from where things burst out. Uh, I definitely like this, this section that I read to you, I kind of cut and paste. So it's more so in its original form. One of the joyous things that you're talking about, about when you told stories though, is that you're allowed to kind of like, I can make a whole dense world in the space of pages. And when, and I had an opportunity, I went back and I kind of spent more time with the daughter, even more time with the mother and had the daughter, that scene where the daughter came and, and talking about her coming five months ago to have the, the pastor lay hands on her. I actually have that in, in the book now. So you can see that whole the process of kind of like, you know, yeah. pulling teeth to get your child to believe in something that you believe with, with the very marrow of your bones, you know? And so that, that was, I, I knew that I wanted to kind of explore that kind of different faith path and belief path. And the, the true religion for me actually was just like the religion of the, this mother and daughter, the religion of, of, um, of like mother and child, you know, that was what, what you know, stayed strongest in every iteration, um, whether I, you know, I, I slowed down on the church parts or I, you know, I wanted to kind of, to further illustrate what it meant to be, you know, like you, like, I mean, you know this, like, you know, it's like ha having your heart outside you and like, you know, and, and trusting that the world will treat your, your child right. And now this child wants to be a mother and now I have to go through that same process. I knew that I wanted to explore that to its, you know, its very core, so. There is something amazing in this story and in many stories, I was really struck by exactly what you're saying where with a, a novel, it's capacious. There are many things it can do. The story is a closed vessel, right? So even in what you just read, like in the way that you sit in a church and you can hear so many echoes, there's that kind of sonority, right? But maybe yeah. also you hear what's like human and, and hilarious about us too. Somebody's mm -hmm. singing a little flat, right? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I love like that verb, right? The, the, the this six foot tall man is timbered by the preacher. You know, there's just so much like delight in in the, the kind of pointless detail also that you can really focus on in a sentence, in a scene, in a story. Um, you, it can sustain that kind of pressure on the language and you're sort of, it's a demanding, right? Because as a reader, you're having to, um, you're, you're asking us to really pay that kind of attention. You're saying, I will reward this attention. Um, but that idea yes. of like the faith, you know, I wrote this out, uh, Nana, cause it just, I was like, oh my God, she moves from saying mother, which is such a like <laughs> mother to mommy by the over the course of this story, you know. Um, and, you know, there, I, without giving it away, the real risk, it's sort of the other thing that you can do in a story. It's not, it's less about the like the big Hollywood blockbuster plot, right? It's like you slow us down and let us feel what a risk it is to tell your mother something that you think is going to result in your like eviction from Eden. You are going to lose, there is this way where all so much of the love. It is, it is unconditional, but of course in a family, it can sometimes feel very conditional, right? It's like, please believe what I believe, behave as I behave, you know? And I think that risk, you let us feel it, right? She's like, okay, I'm gonna confess something to you and that might be it for me. And she says, you know, I have faith in you, my daughter. That's the locus Ooh. of my faith. But I was thinking about, because the story is compressed, every time you sort of invert a question or, you know, we, you, you, we can really feel it, right? The move from like mother, which is like <laughs> to mommy, <laughs> like, or what faith becomes in each of these specific moments. Um, you see why I, I love this woman, because she's such a, like a detailed reader and like the perfect reader for me, because like in those spaces, especially short stories, which are so dense for me, I, I, I don't like to waste like a sentence or a moment, right? I feel like every sentence has to be pulling its weight. And that's something that I feel like, you know, that allows my short stories to be more capacious because they don't, they, they carry, they do, they have muscle and they have girth on them, so. They have I muscle and they have girth and questions. I think that was really striking to me on this one. You know, I was rereading um, It Takes a Village 
and thinking about how, you know, so this is a story about um, these human traffickers and it's also alternating perspectives. Um, first you meet the sort of, um, uh, a we, the, the Salikis, um, who are sort of in, in a self justifi just justification project in the wake of this page six report, a six report about how they have been sort of pimping out their, um, I don't, I'm not, you know, it's, they're, they're, but the self-justification is hilarious, right? And at first, as a reader, I felt very smug in my, con, you know, condemnation of them. And as these questions go on, how could it be otherwise? How could we be otherwise? I began to feel increasingly uncomfortable, and I'm sure the, exactly the way you intend, right? Because you feel yourself to be complicit in this wider story, right? In like, in a kind of like, patriarchal, capitalist, enterprise, neo-imperialist, you think about the way that your own life is embedded in this wider story. And then, and then that distance of judgment collapses, or that was my experience. And the same is true, you know, um, you, I was gonna ask you just about this, uh, it feels so deliberate to me to lay the stress on, um, on saying, you know what, I'm not a victim and let me present to you um, all of these sort of like half articulated assumptions that you're bringing to a story like this one mm -hmm. about who has agency, who has power. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think you first read like the um, the parents, the, the Salikis, like, you know, first person floor perspective. And one of the great things you did with me is like, you know, you, you, you had a conversation about me, like, we don't want to feel smug, we don't want to feel shot in for it. How can we make um, people feel empathy for these, you know, this couple, like the choices that they made. And what you're talking about is exactly what I often do because I'm asking them, like, you know, I'm asking people to look at, like, you know, the circumstances, look at what America mm -hmm. is today. You know, people, like, we just went through, like, a, you know, a social justice reckoning, like one of the worst health, you know, health crises in this country and the globe or this world's history. And people, we're just so shocked like oh my god we didn't realize we had the, all these infrastructural structural deficits right all these things are like what are happening in on the page in in that story right like these things are like you know maybe we're blinded to we live in our little gilded bubbles mm -hmm. but yeah but you know like it is people do do these adoptions because they think oh i'm giving a child a better opportunity so they do buy children you know people like you know do these things so this is part of like you know this is part of capitalism. This is part of a system that makes things sometimes feel like, oh, we can be transactional that even in the affairs of love and relationships. So I constantly wanted to make sure like, you know, that I allow that perspective to kind of seep through and people could understand like, you know, this happens in cold to sucks across, across the country. People's yearning for that kind of American dream can lead them to be complicit in making choices that um, are, um, like are not beneficial to others in like different countries and different um, social economic status uh, statuses. I mean, that was one of the things I really wanted to hammer home. And especially, you know, I, I wasn't being pedantic about it. It just was coming out because that was just where they were. I, was, I had a lot of enormous empathy for the parents. And then like, so you read that version and then like a year later, like their girl, I mean, I won't see the name because the name comes out in the book. I was like, okay, this insistent voice kept coming to me and just like, okay, so is that is that it? Are we done? Are you not going to talk about my story? Okay, come on now. You know, first of all, you got the, you got these people you have their say for you know. So, and I and it, and it was literally it was like I was being like you know like I was not it wasn't even me it was just the story the voice of this character wanted to say some had something to say and came out like with a disposition like a, like an Uzi like <laughs> just staying at all the you know and had all. You know, like this is why these these people, like you know, this is the, the choices that are being made around the world. Like you know, this idea of this poor victimized African yeah. child—that's what people. That's what you like to kind of um, to imbibe and to kind of take in. And that, and so because you think that you think that you're always going to be the savior. So she right. then she comes into immediately kind of just saying, okay, hashtag because you care, hashtag because save our kids what have you so that that's her kind of persona because she comes from a family where she feels is complete no it's not it doesn't have the same trappings as like you know you know this this house that she ends up in in new jersey in the suburbs with three cars and a three car garage but there was happiness and honor in her own way, way of being and yeah. that's what i wanted to have the kind of those two you know um those two kind of like you know points of view like push up against each other and none of them like it but i also have her you know that particular you know character 
she's also like fallible and makes choices that are kind of like, you know, like, you know, full of like, oh my goodness, I, can't, I would never do that, you know. Um, so I, I feel like both of them, like, you know, each, each character, is, all the characters in each perspective, they have like um, a humanity to, the, to them because neither of them is right, fully right, and neither of them is fully wrong. They're mm -hmm. both, you know, flawed and, um, and products of our time. So. And pro I think that's what I love about all of these stories is there is no, it completely foregrounds the context in which people are making these choices. So there really isn't any room for you, the reader, to sit in, in, the, in the kind of easy judgment or superiority. And in fact, what you what hearing from, I, I don't want to give away her name either because it lands with a lot of power, but <laughs> hearing like, it's hard. It's hard with some of these stories. Now that's your fault because you made that they're suspenseful. So I don't, I don't want to like give too much away, but you know, you, I think what felt very powerful to me about that is you think about how it's dehumanizing also, right? It's sort of like, did you want to see this as just, it's also dehumanizing to think of someone as like this flat victim. It's, mm -hmm. a, you know, a lot, there's a lot of critique in this book about sort of like our neo-imperialist attitude, you know, just even like the aid mm -hmm. community, what is actually underwriting some of that like charitable impulse, you know, it's uncomfortable and you, and you exhume that and present that to us, right? in all the ways that like our experience is commodified right now. I was thinking reading this book, you know, and I know you mentioned to me, I guess that was another question I had. Um, books take a long time to come into the world. Sometimes I think because you can buy them on Amazon, you know, my uncle thinks they're just like a shoe or something, you know, <laughs> he's like five stars for this prostate cushion, two stars <laughs> for your book, Karen, like it's, you know, um, I, I don't think he understands sort of like the sunk time inside of a book. But I mean, this scaffolds, you know, huge changes in this country and world. And one of them is tech, you know, the way that our lives are completely tech mediated and the pandemic has accelerated that, you know, exponentially. So I was reading this thinking about, you know, in um, Schoolyard Cannibal, a lot of this is a story told in the second person point of view. And a lot of it engages with like how painful it is to feel that there is nothing in the culture, in your school books, in the wider world that mirrors the complexity and dignity of your own experience. And I was like, you, you, it used to be that like, you just sort of looked in a mirror, right? Or you looked into like another's gaze. And now we have like this narcissist pond that is, <laughs> you know, all of our Apple products and mm. social media. Um, is, when you were going back in to do revisions, I mean, I, one of my favorite stories, um, which has a new title now. It was Marginalia. Now it's uh, Rain Check uh, at MamaCon. Thank you, Rain Check at MamaCon. Yeah. I know in the first version, Facebook is like sort of how the kids are interacting now. And now it's, it's like micro generations um, have passed since then. Um, yeah. What were you hoping sort of what, how, how did you want to kind of engage with, with, with technology in the way that it's sort of, um, creates creating selves. Um, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, like, I mean, I, I think I was telling you because it was so weird because even like, you know, I had a lot of, I, I didn't mean it to be so, but I ended up having a couple of teen and young protagonists and they, the way they use social media and technology, it just like, I mean, I, I did not have, like I had an Instagram page, but I was, it was just like, there was nothing on there. I just started using it. My friend Bose can attest to this because she gave me like little tutorials. She was just like, okay, look at this page, try to do like this. Cause I was just like, what should I put on this thing? It's like a beast, it always wants content. I'm confused, you know? Um, so when I read, when I wrote the first like, you know, version of like, let's say like, um, um, Rain Check and MomoCon where they're like all these teen protagonists and they're at Comic-Con and they're like engaging with all these technologies. Chat roulette was still a thing. I was just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, so I was like completely like, you know, like vines were a thing. It's like one or two ye years later, all those like everything, the things I put in there, I had to kind of like completely like revisit some of those choices and and bring their, their, you know, the way they engage with media up to date, you know? So I actually have at some point when one of the characters is talking about her life and like, you know, her wanting to have these sweeping changes and, and be a much more, you know, and, you know, like outspoken person, more bold. She's like, man, I wish I could face two in my whole life, slap a Valencia filter on the whole thing. Did I know what a Valencia filter was? No, but I know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, so I mean, so it was interesting kind of using like, you know, like technology in, in that space. And then in school, you're a cannibal. I'm talking about like, you know, all the, you know, this idea of like symbolic annihilation. And that's the 
um, idea that you are, certain people are mis misrepresented, underrepresented, or absent from media, so they don't see themselves in, in, um, in book leaves, they don't see themselves on film screens, they don't see themselves on, on TV. I mean, and when I say that they don't see themselves is because if you see yourself, and I remember growing up with this, like, you know, like it would be Channel U and in DC, and it would be, always be like, you know, like, you know, like these old Tarzan films, and there was always the savage, you know, the dark of heart, of, you know, heart of darkness African, and that was always, I was like, is that supposed to be me? <laughs> so, I mean, that was what I grew up with, and I think like the technology, like the, when I'm watching my nieces grow up in the landscape today, I'm so much more hardened because they have access to other forms of media. There's a lot of content that is made on the continent by creative, you know, creatives there, and people are telling their own stories. Like you know, citizen journalism allows journalism allows people to tell their own stories, and it doesn't have to come from these one, you know, all supposedly all knowing kind of like Western and like you know patronizing type of like you know media bot entities who tell like these particular stories that you know that kind of bleed if it, it bleeds it leads type of stories and and like and I say this to say that not that those stories don't need to be told of course the atrocities happen they happen all the, over the place but I I tell people like I lived in Africa for four years I never met a warlord you know I went to prom you know so I I mean I and I would just I want I wanted to fig, figure out a way to kind of write stories where the, you know, it wouldn't be like the only time people could recognize our humanity was if somebody was pointing a gun at our heads. So that was one of the things that, you know, just like, okay, let me have to figure out a way to kind of tell these stories. Um, and the story of, uh, for that young woman in school year cannibal, unfortunately her story, and you know, she she's kind of caught in that kind of like Amber in that time when that other kind of viewing of self was not necessarily available. But I think things are changing and, you know, but every once in a while, I'll be watching a show and it'd be like, children are starving in Africa. And I'm just like, children are starving in America, yo. <laughs> you know, like, so, you know, so, it's so that, interesting. You know? Yeah, it's so funny. I mean, I was just thinking about, we had this recent, we did have like a pretty disastrous season here in Portland, but because of sort of like the Fox News magnification and distortion of what was really happening, mm -hmm. suddenly a large percentage of Americans thought that Portland was like, you know, right. Beirut. And it was so we were, and I was like, this it really, I was like, you know, living in it. I was like, oh, this is what there's a financial incentive also to distort <laughs> and um and a political one. And it's, you know, so it's it is, it is, it feels so valuable to say, I am gonna root you're gonna here is like a, a consciousness that you can inhabit and experience in all of the you know, the messiness and the contradiction that is being a person. Um and I think yep. fiction does that. I think your fiction does that much, but you know, even movies, there's a, there's a kind of opacity there. We were talking a little bit about how frustrating it is, just sort of like the mean girl gets her comeuppance trope, or you know, like the sisterhood where there's never any conflict, <laughs> you know, there's never any jealousy um, that just ends up feeling in a different way, very sexist, right? Because it's sort of, mm. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of, um, like, um, I actually hadn't realized this, once again, like, you know, when you're writing these stories, you don't really see the forest or the trees, but you you notice a lot of different kind of late motif, motifs that I didn't notice. Like, you were talking about, oh, you talk about motherhood a lot, and a lot of interviewers recently have been telling me, oh, you write about a lot of really empowered women. I was like, mm -hmm. or like women in their, all of their kind of like, you know, you know, complexity, and I hadn't realized, like, oh, yeah, like, most of my, you know, heroes and her heroines are, are you know, like I center a lot of women, women of you know color and African women, and like you know their aunties, they you know their hairdressers, and like all these like kind of like you know like offshoot people in their lives. And I just wanted us to be in our fullness, you know, like like as you're saying, we're we're complicated beasts. We're not always happy, always sad, you know, and especially coming from like you know my own cultural background and like this kind of idea of being, you know, the good immigrant daughter. And this is not something that necessarily was forced on me by my parents. My parents were incredibly supportive and rather progressive, but it was just something that I, I had noticed, like, you know, this kind of stuff that, you know, women have, you know, that happens women across the world. They have, you know, a lot of expectations, you know, be likable, be this, be that. So I just allowed my, you know, characters not to be likable, you know, to to suckle other people's children, you know, just do things that, you know, <laughs> you know, they're gonna do it. And then it's like you decide whether that's like, you know, like a, a you know, 
like a, a kind of mortal sin or not. But I, you know, like it's I, I don't pass judgment on the choices they make because I feel that these they're human and these things are within the realm of possibility and it's just what they're going to do, you know? So that's one of the things I realized that, yeah, I do write a lot of women. Yeah. I loved, um, you know, I went to a Zoom baby shower relatively recently, which I'm going to say is maybe the most awkward of Zoom. I mean, I heard, or up, it's up there. It's up there. And I was thinking so much about one of my favorite stories in this collection, Dance Sophia Dance, where you, um, you, you're aware always at a baby shower that you're excavating for each person, whether it's, it's usually unspoken, right? But it's like so many women have suffered miscarriages, stillbirths infertility they just don't want to have children and for the for all of time people will be asking them about that right like rogue taxi drivers will just be you know feel totally fine to ask them about their reproductive history I mean I think like it's always a little bit fraught I think or that's been my experience of these these particular celebrations and this, there's this as a doyen of the metro era area Cameroonian community my cousin's social calendar is lousy with cry dyes born houses knock doors and they're pale American cousins, the funeral, baby shower, and engagement party. And so you have this sort of like public milestone. And then there are many spectral milestones in that story. And I wanted to ask about that because I love the way that you structured this story. There's a diary and, um, you know, this woman has started keeping a journal again. And so maybe you enter this story thinking, wow, this woman is she seen, you know, they're in the way that these are not my voices, but you again, there's a lot of sort of like inherited sexism. So it's like, oh, please be nice. You know, don't don't cast a side eye at this beautiful <laughs> moment. Um, whatever. I think I, I think my question is just sort of like, how did you find this structure where the, the diary becomes kind of like um, an incubator, not for a baby, but for this woman to discover who she is going to be in the wake of one one sort of story transforming. Yeah, I mean, I honestly like I, I love a good conceit. I hadn't <laughs> for some reason there are a lot of my my stories like you know some they're they're um like structured around one story like Kings has the, the spine of a different hairdos and like you know, and I didn't realize that I was going to be doing di diary entries, but I I was I this is another character that was fairly mute and much like um, uh, Astrid Atangana and Rimshuk and Mo Momokan, like who like finds a way to kind of voice and have a creative self in, in, in writing graphic novels. Um, this particular linguist, linguistic anthropologist is still kind of tongue tied and, and still has difficulty kind of like, you know, um, feeling comfortable in her own skin and expressing herself in, in certain environments. And she's like transitioning, she was in New York and now she's in Washington DC. She's thrust among her family members and in a society which is like very intimate and uh, for good or for nay, you know, like you have this kind of like pressure to be, to conform and be a certain way. And she's following along to all these different family events and, and watching the modalities in which women behave and doesn't necessarily feel like they encompass who she is completely, but there's some parts of them that, that resonate with her. So who does she go to speak about this? And, you know, so that her diary is a space where she feels like she can be honest. She can um, explore her emotions, what she's feeling, what she has yet to say to her her cousin, who's a close friend, but they had had a period of perhaps estrangement because you know living in different cities, going on different life trajectories, but you know coming down there and feeling the pressures, you know. Of, oh, when are you going to have a child? Hey, when are you going to get married? And all that kind of stuff that she feels down there, you know, that makes her feel like she can't have these other deeper conversations around what she considers, you know, um, her own life path. You know, that was like what the impetus to kind of like explore that in that space that for allow her voice to come through. through because um, in those moments, she's kind of like everything that she does is kind of mitigated by hey, this, this auntie and that uncle and this, you know, all these kind of voices. It's like upon. the panopticon of family, <laughs> right? It's, <laughs> it's like very, yes. that was so present to me. And you see how, how love and fear are just sort of in ever shifting ratios, you know, that there, there is these pressures, you know, I know um, in um, Astrid's story at one point, she has this like Princeton acceptance letter folded into her backpack. And she's just thinking about sort of like, she can see the whole template you know, all of the boxes to check. And it seems so narrow to her, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that's another thing that I felt in each of these stories, just the narrowness of, you know, what it really takes to find the leverage to 
pull away and what feels extremely risky about that what can feel annihilating about that because you know it's the unwritten you know or it's the unthought possible um and i think like a couple of these stories there's such if it, you know it's never like a happy ending um you know Are it's we- like the nana it's like the <laughs> it's like the you know, gift to the clouds, right? But it's, you, you don't really get the sense that it's a stable epiphany at all or that anything is concluded. It's just sort of like the shell is breaking open and a transformation's violent. I think you made that so present to me too. I and mean, that, that, that's exactly what, oh, this is why I love you, Karen. But yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm trying to do. Like, I, I'm, I'm not trying to say that one path is, has more merit than, and than the other. Right. I'm just allowing my characters to actually, um, entertain the idea of another of this uh, the other non-traditional path right you know like so for Astrid you know that I- idea of being that good immigrant daughter I went through that you know like I said a lot of pressure you know and, it, and it's part it's it's actually you know help, it's helpful like our parents want us to have a better education better opportunities I understand it but what if you are like to create you know a young t- person who wants to be a, a singer songwriter or what if you want to you know what what, what are your paths in that particular type of society and that culture? What are your paths to exploring those other options for like, for, you know, self-fulfillment as, as a human being? And that's what I wanted to explore. And not to say that, you know, that Princeton doesn't have its own merits, you know, but I wanted to explore that, that this character giving himself the permission to, to I'd have that idea, have that dream for themselves. And whether they go that route or not, you know, just that kind of co- internal conversation is just what I want to kind of like put out there in the world, you know. And it, it happens a lot with my characters because I do like, you know, that is my, my upbringing, but it's also just like, you know, something I think like, since I do I don't like write a lot of women characters, like, you know, just the idea of giving ourselves permission to kind of push beyond what, you know, society says that are the norms for us, you know, and we think we get there, then we have like, you know, we, gr- we regress, you know? So oh, yeah. every time yeah. you think we're like, oh, fourth wave feminism, we're done, you know? Then you're like, me to move and then you're just like, oh my God, what, what? Is, <laughs> is it still going, is it still going on, you know? So, I mean, I, I think that's what I do a lot in my work is just like, have a, you know, give yourself permission to have these conversation to figure, you know, we just push the, the conversation a bit further and further so that this is something that like, you know, your granddaughter or your great granddaughter doesn't have to kind of deal with, you know, like, you know, it will just be par for the course that, you know, yeah, I can do this, that, and the other, you know? Right, right. Let's loosen the corset strings just a little bit. You know, I would be- I, do. I can't believe, you know. <laughs> I, I would be remiss, I think, if I didn't ask you, because I know you must get some version of this question a lot. I know we have this in common, just sort of an attraction to, I never think of it as a binary, right? But like the continuum of speculative fiction. Mm-hmm. So some of these stories are, they are, they're in a sort of consensus reality we would recognize. Maybe the language is what's heightened. And some of the stories have like, you know, a mommy wada <laughs> mm-hmm. and her siren sisters, um, you know, just sort of uh, seductresses of the sea, you know, just sort of charting their own course. Um, and, and, and there it's sort of, it's in, if in one story, this appears as sort of like a, a joke or a way of shaming someone, you know, for their alleged, you know, sluttiness. Then there's another story where it's like, we are gonna plunge into the world mm-hmm. of the mommy wada. Um, and I wondered a little bit about if you could just tell me, I mean, I, I, I feel like so much of it is, is probably um, fast moving and instinctual, but I just sort of wonder like when you know, like, okay, this feels like the right story to, yeah, plunge into the waters of myth, you know, and, and, and this is gonna be, you know, a little bit closer to reality on a Wednesday. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, you know, like I come from like, you know, that African background, which is like those, those, um, those lines between like, you know, like what is real and what is like memorex. <laughs> they're very, well, right. like, I do too, you know that, Nana, like the fibroids like and the snakes. Right. I'm like, you know, it's just, just keep doing the optician's lens. It's the same, it's the I same mean, world. <laughs> literally some of the stuff that I say, like, you know, like, you know, somebody's having trouble dreaming, like, you know, your mom gets your little second, puts it under the bed and bada bing, bada boom. We- Witches are, you know, no witches can come. I mean, that yeah. was like my life. Like, so it's like, and I'm not, I'm not going to say that, like, oh, my heavens, I don't believe in this, that we can believe in like, you know, like, you know, um, that we were actually eating, drinking the blood of Jesus and eating, you know, eating mm-hmm. his, of his flesh. Like, you know, these are just different belief systems. And so I come from belief systems, which, you know, some of these, these things kind of like, you know, they're intertwined. So it just makes sense to me. You Absolutely. know, I think they call it in some spaces like magical realism, but it's just like, you know, Tony Morris is looking, you know, Gabriel Garcia, which is like, 
that's just regular roots. So, oh, you know, that's that's such a know, beautiful that's answer. Like, that's how like, I feel too. I'm like, it's yeah, realism and you sometimes just, yeah. certain things are a little more, right. Yeah, you're yeah, you're sort just, of emphasizing just, laying the stress here yeah, or there. Yeah. I, I feel like it's really, you know, so Mami Watas, you know, I think it means that, 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 that um, the Nyongu, like, you know, kind of like um, religious, I, I call it, like, it's not necessarily a cult, but it's like, just like a small, like, you know, very religious um, following. And it exists, you know, it exists to this day. So, I mean, these are real belief systems and what, mm-hmm. and, and real, like, um, and I have always found Mami Watas fascinating, you know, like, um, like I, I, you know, we're talking about like women's um, sexuality. I mean, they are succubi. And, and if you call somebody like in another story, like, you know, this kind of idea, this this fear of women's kind of sexual agency, you know, like, you know, mm-hmm. so I want to just taking you to the, you know, like the, how far can I take that and have this, like, you know, this these women who kind of own their kind of like independence, you know, from from like the world of man, you know, and like, you know, what does that mean? What does that look like when one of them actually falls in love with a mortal man? So it's an, an interesting, like, kind of like, you know, tension. And um, I was really fortunate, like, you know, at that time I was at the Clarion, right, um, where it's writer's workshop. Um, at a six-week boot camp full of like, you know, freak flags flying and all these <laughs> my fellow nerds talking about Black Mirror episodes and the work of Chip Delaney. So um, that was that was written there in like the course of like four or five days, you know, because we had to write we had to write a story a week. I was just like, hmm, Christine from the from the from the workshop is there, here today. But um that I mean, is it, boot camp. <laughs> yes, it was really, it was intense, it was wonderful, it was incredibly generative and um, but I, that was something like, you know, one of these things, like, you know, these stories that I knew that I, because my impulses, you know, as a writer, they tend to be, I want to write about women, and I, I definitely have interests in writing about gender norms and, and roles. I'm interested in writing about African identity and particularly hybrid African identity. So these kind of things just start to kind of like, you know, they're like in the back of my head, as you're mm-hmm. talking about like the impulses. I never know, I'm gonna, I don't necessarily sit down and say, today I'm gonna write about mermaids, you know, but you know, you just start writing and what comes to me typically is like the voice. And once I started realizing that I'm gonna write in that kind of magical realist voice and kind of be in that space where, you know, that narrative that narrative voice is kind of like, you know, knowing the wink wink. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, what, what, what story are they gonna tell me? They were gonna tell me about this, this 200 year old Mami Wata who's just like, I don't give a, about men, but then all of a sudden falls in love and like, oh, wow, that's interesting. So that's what happens, you know, I don't know that it's gonna happen, but once that voice starts telling me things and that first paragraphs, you know, starts right. to kind of push its way into my subconscious, I'm good to go, so. Oh, I love, I love that answer. Cause that, right. It's sort of like the incantation has to happen on you first, right? Yeah, <laughs> like you sort of yeah. have to get rolled into that world. It does. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, you know, Karen, from the way we talk, you know, we speak to each other. We, I've got a very powerful, like internal voice. So that the voices of my characters and my narrators have to be way more interesting for me to be like, oh, what you got to say? Because otherwise I'm just like, man. Turning yeah. up the volume <laughs> exactly. on the karaoke like, yeah. machine. So that's why they tend to be like very voicey and ballsy. Because I'm just like, I mean, I could just be net- watching Netflix and chill. Like, you know, you better oh, be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Hey, Karen and Nana, can I interrupt for a minute? Absolutely. So sorry. That was wonderful. I've been enjoying your conversation so much. Um, I actually let let it go on for a little bit longer than I meant to. <laughs> I was just I was just absolutely entranced. Um, I wanted to go ahead and pop in real quick just because we had a couple questions come up. Do you mind? Oh, Karen, your questions were wonderful, and Nana, you've just been so open and lovely with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so um, much. Clarence asks. Um, First, he says, Nana, many congrats on your debut collection with regard to creating characters and storytelling. When writing a short story, when do you feel a story is done? Hmm. It typically happens. I mean, honestly, like, so this is what I've many, many times people read my stories and they were like, oh, this character stayed with me for days. Are you going to turn this into a novel? They want it more and more and more. I'm just like, my character is done with me. They're done with me. They're <laughs> goodbye. We're done. They've, they've told me everything they wanted to. It's just like meeting somebody fascinating, you know, on the train and you have a really, really great conversation. But when they say goodbye, they're, they're done. <laughs> you know, they're just like, so it's never, it's never something that like, you know, I don't necessarily, you know, I think maybe that's the work of revision a little bit when you go back now. But most of my stories end pretty much the same as in, they did in the first draft. You know, I might do something more, you know, imagistic towards the, at the end. But in terms of the, you know, the the ending, I, that's when they're done. You know, um, I've gone back and like, you know, maybe elongated scenes and maybe maybe put more emphasis on one character or another. But 
I've never ended up being like, oh, well, I'm going to write down like 40 more pages of this story, you know, um, th that is, they, they tend to tell me, okay, this is a natural denouement. This is a natural climax. Um, it was nice meeting you, Nana. Goodbye. <laughs> so. I love that. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question. I, I might mispronounce the name. I'm so sorry. Abbasid, maybe? Abbasid? Um, having Abbasidi. Okay, I was close. Um, <laughs> having lived in so many different worlds yourself, what kinds of new worlds do you want to explore in your fiction? Mm, oh my goodness. I mean, I definitely know that I'm interested in doing, um, writing a graphic novella down the line. I teach graphic novels and I'm such a proponent of, of using those different forms and that visual aspect. Like, I love that whole kind of like plastic, you know, being that conversation between vision the visual and the, and the text. Um, I want to do screenplay. <laughs> so I'm like, I, I'm really interested in telling stories in any way possible that I can. So I want to be in, you know, allow myself to um, maybe even tell some of these same stories, but in a different form and see what, what kind of tensions and what things are raised by, you know, moving this to a, like, you know, maybe like a like a short film version of like, you know, com a Comic-Con scene or something like that. I'm, fa I'm fascinated by the kind of language of these different art forms, you know, like, so, so like that's even within the book, like I have like, you know, a prose poem and then I do have some ekphrastic like, moments where there's imagery within the text. So I'm, I'm likely gonna keep on pushing into that. I mean, one day when, you know, when they are letting us, you know, they invent the technology that we can smell when we sense to the books, books I'm gonna be like, okay, how, how can I get that? You know, how can all my books smell like, like foo foo and coffee corn? That's what I wanna, you know. Um, thank you. Yeah, there's um, another question um, from Kosh. Can you please say hi, Nana? Um, she, uh, this person is from your fiction class mm -hmm. and um, asks, what's your editing process? And um, she mentioned sending notes on a piece that she'd sent you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Let's focus on the, your editing process for right yes. now. I mean, that's part like, I mean, we, Kosh, stop trying to come for me. You know, you, you and I had a long conversation. Like, <laughs> so this is one of those things like, you know, um, I'm like, I tend to be uh, that work, that work of revision, like the first time, like, you know, that I, that I write a piece you know, I'm my, the language is typically there, but not but the work my, my editing process and the work of revision is typically around trying to figure out when I can those moments where I need to slow down and uh, allow the characters to breathe more. So just figuring out, I mean, when I'm talking to my students, I'm, I'm typically going through the you know the different parts like you know what is the language that we do, what are we doing at the level of language what are we doing at the level of characterization is each scene pulling its emotional weight in terms of like developing this character or, or do we have enough dialogue is there enough of a um a balance between scene and exposition so that's the kind of work that i do in that in those moments the the um the actual bulk of the story the meat and the and the kind of like, you know, bone, the spine of the story typically stays the same for me. It's just going back to, to is me just like kind of using the very tools that I teach my, to, my students to kind of like look back and push against the moments where I feel like, okay, I, I really rushed through that scene. Why did I rush through that scene? Is that a painful scene? Is that a scene where I need to kind of let some more bleeding happen on the page and just put, and then, then working into those spaces? So. That helps a lot. Thank you. Um, that's actually something I was kind of wondering about along with the question Karen asked was about a little bit about how you use genre or how you don't use it, like how you just push against it and do um, and do what you think is best for the story and how it kind of how you push against genre kind of reflects how you push against subject like you really explore all kinds of aspects of your stories and um, learning how you do that is just beautiful. So. <laughs> I'm going to do just a little la just a little announcement. I was doing your tote bag giveaway in the chat. So we've had um, about 10 people enter that. So anybody who types calories into the chat is um, might win a tote bag. <laughs> We're going to pick one winner. So please uh, feel free to type those in and I will keep track of the um, people who jump in. Also, and that tote bag is pretty awesome, you guys. It's really cute. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's on our social media, so go check it out. It's really, really cute. 
and it has, of course, it matches the book. So um, it has like a cover, the cover on it. Um, we will have signed copies soon. Nana is sending us signed book plates. So we're really excited about that. And um, I think that was most of my announcements. I'm going to put the the link to purchase from Hub City in the chat window if anybody else wants to buy a book. Um, and I'll go back to Karen for a minute. Do you have any questions or or do you yeah, guys have anything you that know, you would I, And to? I just, I because when I when we knew each other in, in, in our freezing to thawing Iowa days, <laughs> People, people were literally, literally freezing. Unfortunately, I mean, it's sad, but people were like human popsicles. And I mean, no, it was, guys, it was in, um, yeah, speaking of the context in which choices are made, I just remember seeing like these houses that would become like Argus eyed with all these frat boys, you know? And I was like, I guess spring is here. <laughs> like, <laughs> they're up on the roofs. <laughs> Doesn't seem it's wise sure. to bring so much liquor on a roof, but I guess that's just what we do here in the springtime. Um, it was an interesting land. I felt like I felt like that semester I re have was one of the very best of my lifetimes, and so much of it was that in our cohort, people were doing such interesting work. I learned so much. I wonder a little bit. I know you've taught at many places now, and just I'm so curious about sort of how, um, yeah, teaching the short story. If there's some, you know, you know, we're all kind of linguistic self-interpreting creatures, as you remind us throughout this book, like if there are ways that that's fed into your own ambitions for your writing or how you think about the form. I mean, I think I'm like instinctively a short storyteller. I mean, as you know, like the novel, like we're poor little babies, little, like we're like the redheaded stepchildren of like, you know, stepchildren, like of, of like oh the God, novel. What is a novel? Who is? And, like, <laughs> and I just finished the novel too, but I was like, it, it never made me like feel like, oh my, my, my short stories are nothing now, <laughs> you know, it was the short stories for me, like, you know, I love the idea of like, you know, of going into a world and immersing myself there. And, and I feel like just even because of the tension of, and the constraint of the time and the space and like that I'm, I'm there, everything matters, right? It feels incredibly vivid to me. You know, when I was writing the novel, I felt like I was frolicking in pages and frolicking in time. I was just like, oh my God, you know, I could have said this in five, in, in five lines, but you know, then it wouldn't be a novel, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so that's, I mean, I think that's what, why I'm like, I, I love like the short story form because it pushes <laughs> me, it, it just matches with my own interests. Like, you know, and I can, I can like, um, it, that kind of, like I said, that conceit, that um, that that um, constraint on me, you know, allows me to kind of really, really be like, you know, everything has to be robust, everything matters, and and that's what you know. It feels like you know, like I'm like I'm boxing with like you know the words like you know everything is yeah. like a, a fist fight. It feels really, really great, you know. Everything so. matters, and there's so much pressure, like a terrifying, like Olympic pressure on the ending, and that was in every case. Your endings are absolutely surprising. I mean, Jackie was saying sort of like where you push against, you know, generic expectations. They're in no universe what I have predicted any of sort of their, and they don't, you know, it's almost like, I feel like you're directing me to some plateau where I can see the open destiny for these people. <laughs> um, you know, and but I was thinking about like, and you know, people talk about, I, I, one of the first emails I sent you was about your impeccable ear. And I think sometimes hear things like style or they'll hear, oh, a sentence has a high polish on and it's very musical, it's lyrical. It's almost like as if you can partition the sound from the sense, which you just can't. It's that's, mm -hmm. I mean, I think like, I was so aware reading this too, like you experience a story inside your body mm -hmm. and someone is scoring music for your body. And mm -hmm. so the last sentences, I just, I was like, oh, you feel, I mean, they, they read effortlessly, but I know that you were tuning them up. <laughs> like music because it matters. And I think with a story as opposed to a novel, there's a kind of integrity to that geometry. You can sort of walk the periphery, you can hold it in your head in a different way than like a 400 page saga. Um, yeah, I think like, you know, you're right. I mean, I mean, the language you use, like, you know, you and I have spoken a lot about like the musicality and the lyricism. And that's something that kind of like, like I remember I was, I think I was like eating it to like watching that, um, that Flix movie, The Queen's Gambit, where she could see the chess moves and everything on the ceiling. And that was how it feels with me with like sentences. Like, I just like know my body, like, okay, I need another beat to this sentence. Something has to happen, you know, like, I'll feel like the music, the, the kind of ebbs and swells and the, of, the, of, of a sentence and the syntax. And that just like knowing where to land, that, that kind of is like written large against the story, right? I just somehow like, I know, okay, this is where I'm going to land. And it, it, 
invariably stays the same with, you know, like I'm saying, I mean, my endings, I don't like, I know that there's some writers who write their endings even before they write, you know, the first paragraph, you know. For me, um, once I get to that ending, it just feels, it feels right, just with that same instinct and that same kind of gut sense that I do when I'm writing even just the sentences that, well, this is where, this is the beat where, you know, where, that it breaks that one last beat, breaks things open in a way that, you know, maybe yeah. a paragraph earlier, um, there would have been so many questions, but I now I'm giving you this one last paragraph and that gives you the sense of possibility or not. So that yeah. that's what happens to me um, with my endings. Um, I wish I had something, I mean, I always like try to figure out ways to kind of, you know, like, it's just, you know, you're teaching, you're always trying to figure out how to ways to kind of like make these things into like, okay, how can I teach an ending? You know, I read a lot yeah. of essays, but that for my for me, my endings are just like that, they're instinctual. In that it's that gut check, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really, you know, Schoolyard Cannibal is one where I remember an earlier version I read, we were talking about sort of like, well, what is the note? It really matters with this story. It's short, mm -hmm. right? And it has like, it feels like a prose poem almost. It has those rhythms. So it, it truly like it, it will, it will shine back and, and transform your understanding of what you've just read. So what what is like the timbre that I want to end on? And I love this, the ending and the collection, which is different yeah. than the ending. That was- It was, it is different. Know. Yeah, I think I, I you know, I, you know, you have that, like the, the ending that I had in the thesis was like, oh, let me try to, to project into the future where she's all happy. And, right. you know, like, you know, it's like one of those Hollywood movies where they do like a little, like, you know, where is she like, now? Oh, yeah. yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> you know, or they'll have like, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll do some kind of like, oh, the focus group said that this is like, people like happy endings. I'm just like, no, this is not, you know, everything doesn't have to have that kind of like, you know, Disneyfied ending. This is like, you know, I, that particular story is full of pathos and pain. And I think that, you know, so what I do is actually now harken back to her child self and have us ending on that like, kind of note of like, you know, where we started, where this is where, all, it all began like you know this is why she turns from her likeness because of all these different things that she's seen about people who look like her who share her soon ethnicity her seen her background she sees herself writ large and what she sees writ large in the western landscape is not is not um it's not edifying so i, I thought it, it felt more true to, to the ending of that of that just to kind of end on that note and from me to be like oh and then one day she was happy ever after you know and, yeah, and as a know. tool right as a, as a fully self-actualized person I mean those are the endings that I find least plausible you know or it's mm. someone who's like and now levitating you know <laughs> yeah, right. you, could, you two could be like me for three easy installments of 1990 mm -hmm. or whatever you know it's like mm -hmm. the kind of everything is conjugated and, and resolved yeah, but I think I mean, what was life is not like that life no is, it's, it's never like you know we don't there are never those easy cat endings like that, you know. I mean, I think I have some happy endings, but you know, it is what it is. Like you know, happy <laughs> is is relative. So, right, more true to real life in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, I it's a little after eight, so I don't want to keep you guys too long. I was again um, enjoying that a lot, so I got um, distracted on the time there. We had a couple more questions, but they were mostly about like future things. So I think we'll we'll go with just what you and Karen talked about. I think that was great. Um, do you have anything you'd like to end on before we go? Thank you guys so much for coming and joining me tonight. Like I said, this is my book baby. It's a long time coming. I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful for each and every one of you guys coming. Yeah, and ja <laughs> Jackie is like, okay, and buy the book, people. She's like, and of course, <laughs> I, love I love it. <laughs> yes, I love. I see one of my students here. Like, so I guess a couple of my students were here, but I had one of my students who was just like, I was trying to get free books for the, my my um the student, my fiction workshop, and he was like, support black women. Also, when we got the, book, I realized that it, it like the the shells are raised. Yeah, so it's, it's the, just like the the. That's like I asked for them to be embossed and she was like I right, well okay we have to change the whole entire um you know this is the same cover but it was just like you know they had to make the cover shots bigger I was like can we do that and she was like yes Grey Wolf they make it you know all dreams come true with Grey Wolf too. so <laughs> I was very happy with that because you it, it's it, I love the tactile feel of it it makes me happy so we love that um yeah I was I was like walking around the shop letting everybody feel it today <laughs> Exactly. This is so happy to my very We've been missing that third dimension, right? It's it's great timing. 
<laughs> right? We need that. Like, we, like everything is mediated by a screen. Everything feels flat and kind of flat, flat. Mm-hmm. And so like, okay, yes, let me have something that's like, you know, let's have, let's live in technicolor. Let's have some 3D in our lives. Well, you were talking about incorporating other senses while you're reading. So it, was, it seemed perfect. Um, I'm telling you when it, when they start pick, making smells for books, it, <laughs> I'll be the first one. <laughs> we need to do that. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of congratulations from everyone in the chat window. Um, just tons of messages um, from Kentucky, Sandra, congratulations, Pramadi, so congratulations, much. Jenny, um, Abbasidi, and Jamie, and Clarence. So happy for you. And we're so glad that you were willing to do your launch day event with us. We were so honored to have you. And Karen, we were just so thrilled that you were willing to join us to talk. My God, this I'm I'm I, I don't want it to be over. Obviously, I have like 97 <laughs> more questions. I'm like, wait, wait. <laughs> and you and I will have to have our own conversation. We're just we revving up. <laughs> Karen and I are going to have like one of these rundowns on Saturday. We ended up talking for two hours. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to bust the stitch. It was ridiculous. So I love it, and I hated to interrupt. I just was like. <laughs> We told that we told Nana and Karen it would okay, we only have to be here for hours. I don't think she did, but can they tell? We knew you were going to have to take control of us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for bravely stepping in. <laughs> we had a bunch of people from Hub City kind of pop in and out during the meeting just to say congratulations, and they're so Thank happy you. for you. So. Thank you. Congratulations. It's such a beautiful book. Everybody buy like 12 copies. Uh-huh. You are from Karen's lips. Uh-huh. <laughs> it will be worth it, I promise. <laughs> All right, everyone. Um, Nana, I hope the rest of your launch week is. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is lovely. Hi, Oscar. <laughs> we have another hello from that's, the Karen That's American capitalism intruding. He's saying, Can I eat my old McDonald's now? <laughs> Yes, you may. <laughs> well, we'll let you guys eat dinner and drink. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys so All much. Right. Bye. Congratulations. Bye, Nana. Thank you. Bye.